Hello, everyone. Hi, Morgan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so this live conversation is in honor of National Adoption Awareness Month, which is a month dedicated to raising awareness about adoption and foster care and a lot of children around the world that do not have permanent homes. Uh, I'm Allie and I am a Chinese adoptee and a program coordinator with the Park Adoption Community Center. I started in August of 2019, so last year. Um, we at the park, we are dedicated to promoting adoption literacy in our world, and uh, we have ongoing conversations like this, along with other programming and connection opportunities throughout the year. Morgan, thank you so much for joining me today. It's really an honor. Apologies, people are still coming in, so I might be a little spotty. <laughs> um, to people who are just joining, um, this is Morgan Hurd. She is a world-class gymnast and also a Chinese adoptee. Before we kick things off, I want to uh, let everyone know that we will probably, Morgan and I will be speaking for the first 20-ish minutes and then sort of open it up to everyone to ask questions as well, because we want this to be really interactive. And I know that a lot of you are eager to meet Morgan too. So Morgan, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself for those who might not know a lot about you? Yeah, of course. So my name is Morgan Hurd. Um, I'm 19 years old. I was adopted from Guangxi, China at 11 months, so June of 2002. Um, I lived in Delaware basically my entire life since I came to the States, uh, multiple towns, but all of Delaware. Um, I started gymnastics when I was about two or three years old. I did like mommy me classes. I also did various of other sports. I did um I did several different types of dance. I did ice skating, soccer, t-ball, obviously gymnastics. And um, as I got older, obviously sports had to dwindle down. I couldn't handle all of that in school and everything else. So, and gymnastics was the one that I always wanted to come back to. I just always thought that it was the absolute most interesting. Everything else, uh, quite frankly, bored me. Um, and then I just, I always knew I, I had big goals from a very young age. And I think that's what really drove me throughout my entire career. I became an international elite when I was, I believe, 13, turning 13 that year. So in 2014, um, and then I made junior national team in 2016. And in 2017 was my first time on senior national team. And I did a few assignments then. And then that year I also went to worlds and that's when I won um, the world championship. I also got a uh, silver on the beam. And then I also went to worlds in 2018 and where we got um, gold for team. And I yeah. also received a bronze all around medal and a silver floor medal. And then um, quite, recently, well, kind of recently, I went to the 2020 American Cup, and I also received gold in that. And obviously, the Olympics um, are my goal. They're still my goal, but that didn't happen this year. So I'm still at home training. I actually graduated uh, high school last year in 2019, decided already had decided that I wanted to defer an extra year um, so that I could try to go to 2021 Worlds. But Kind of worked out in my favor anyways since i since the olympics did not happen this year so as of right now my plan is to attend the university of florida um and compete for them in january of 2022. awesome thanks so much morgan uh i guess to start off with because you've been a professional athlete for all of your life. What has that been like for you and how have you balanced both school and your rigorous training schedule? So obviously my training schedule wasn't as hard when I was younger. Um, I did go to a traditional school up until the sixth grade. I went to, I was in sixth grade and then I 
went to my school for maybe a month, a week of which I missed for a camp. And my coach was just like, hey, we should try homeschool. And I was like, sure, why not? Didn't really know what I was doing. And then I had homeschooled since sixth grade all the way up to 12th grade um, so that I could train more. I train twice a day in the morning. And then we have a break where that's when I did my school and then um, another training session. And when, what was like the moment when you sort of knew you wanted to pursue a career in gymnastics and when like becoming an elite gymnast, um, you sort of knew that it was obtainable for you? Uh, From a a very young age, I always had really big goals. I remember at my very first gym, it was just like a recreational gym. During the holiday season, they would put a tarp over the top of the balance beams. And then inside, there was like these little objects and they called it like the wishing tunnel. And I remember I was like three or four years old, I would go through and um, wish to go to the Olympics. I didn't know what it took to get there. I Mm -hmm. honestly didn't know until I was almost 13 years old what it even took. I didn't know what elite was I didn't know anything I made elite and I was like oh cool and then that same year I made the national championship and I didn't even know what that was I was like okay cool (laughs) but I don't feel like there was like one defining moment when I thought oh I could go far I just always knew that like I have a goal and I just want to achieve it and I'll just I just kind of do whatever everyone else tells me to do in order to get it there Mm -hmm. and what qualities do you think it sort of took to get to the point you're at in your gymnastics career? Um, Obviously, I think it took a lot of determination, um, self-drive. There's a word, but it's slipping my mind at the moment. But but a lot of determination, self-drive, and perseverance, and mental toughness. And I guess transitioning to today, since... uh, COVID-19 and just 2020 in general really shook a lot of things up for a lot of us. How have you um, continued with your training and just anything that uh, you've done to sort of cope with everything going on? Uh, So my gym was closed for a few months. So I was doing my training solely at home. I actually had like um, half of like a low beam and I was doing stuff on that, but obviously there's only so much I could do. So it was, I just focused a lot on um, conditioning and physical strength because although like that's, we do a lot of that at the gym, we do more gymnastics than that. And mostly because you can't do, you can't overload on conditioning when you're a gymnast, especially just because then you won't be able to do your routines that day or the next, it can actually become really dangerous if you're really tired um, and you're trying to do these routines, but I just try to keep a regimented schedule as I would have if I was still going to the gym and just try to keep to that. Mm. Yeah, I saw that. Um, I think it was like a TikTok or maybe it was an Instagram reel where you had stacks of books oh, uh, yeah, for, yeah, yeah, yeah. for like one of your things. Um, yeah. And I guess like what other creative waves have you gone about training um, cool. I was, I have like kind of bad elbows, if you would say I've had three surgeries on one of them. So, uh, there was only like so much like back stuff I could do, but I still wanted to keep up doing back handsprings, but I don't really do standing back handsprings on the floor just cause it bothers my arms. So I mm-hmm. actually pulled my mattress into the middle of my room and was doing back handsprings on top of those. Oh my gosh. And and even sometimes I would take mats outside. I have like a panel mat and then the beam and do it like um, on my deck. (laughs) And how, uh, I guess out of curiosity, how has your family or supported you throughout your gymnastics career? Uh, My family has been very supportive. Obviously they've given up a lot for me as well. They kind of, before I could drive, obviously someone had to drive me to and from the gym. (laughs) Uh, someone has to tra- had to travel with me when I was younger and everything. And just like they kind of, uh, when I was younger, everything revolved more around my gymnastics. But I mean, as I'm older, I'm a lot more independent. I even barely see my mom. We live in the same house, but I barely see her because I get home and I make my own dinner and everything. But my whole family has just been extremely supportive. <clears throat> mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and I guess since it is National Adoption Awareness Month, how has adoption, or if it has, intersected with um, your life as a professional athlete? Uh, I feel like it hasn't really affected me as an athlete that much, maybe um, mentally, but as just because obviously every adoptee knows this, you're curious and you have questions and obvious and all that jazz. But as a gymnast, it hasn't really affected me. Um, obviously, it comes up uh, when I'm at a competition and the commentators always bring it up that I'm from China and everything. Yeah, I know that recently um, you joined the Facebook group, Subtle Adoption Asian Traits, which I am also a part of. And what sort of prompted you to join the group? Um, a TikTok comment. <laughs> oh, really? I, yeah, I was on TikTok and I don't even remember what the video was, but um, someone was like, oh my God, are you part of SAT? And it was like, well, no, what's that? And I just saw it and I was like, that sounds kind of interesting. So like, I checked it out and I'm really glad I joined. I really like the group a lot. <laughs> Have there been any like memorable moments since you've joined the group? Um. Oh my God, I don't even know. Uh, just, I just love the community as a whole. Um, I love the Wednesday night and the Friday night Zooms. I more I'm on the Friday night Zoom just because it's before the weekend so I can stay up later since I don't have training really early in the morning. But I think like uh, two weeks ago, there was a room and like everyone in, the, sometimes with those calls, it's the rooms are either like a hit or miss. They're either like really quiet and awkward or they're just like extremely fun. And somehow I just got like such a great room, breakout room. And we all just like coerced so greatly and it was just like hilarious and then breakout rooms ended and we all and then they put us back into the breakout rooms and it was basically our whole group because we all requested exactly the same person we all requested Anna like every single one of us so that was very funny and then we just kept requesting the same people again for like three or four breakout rooms <laughs> yeah so you were able to like really bond or yeah. like yeah build relationships with people that's awesome I know that there were questions that were submitted about the all around um, documentary series. What was it like filming that series and how, uh, what was the process of you um, being featured in it compared to all the other um, elite gymnasts? Uh, yeah, filming all around it is super cool. It's very awkward just because I personally, I don't know what it stems from, but I personally feel like a very awkward person a lot of the times, especially um, on camera like that. So I was really worried about that initially. I still, I still am. I'm like, I, but at the same time, sometimes I do stuff and I'm like, you know what? I don't even care anymore. It's fine. Someone will laugh at it. It'll make their day. It, but it's super, it's not weird in the gym because I'm very used to that um, from competitions because there's always a camera following us around at competitions, but mm. it's more so weird when they're in my house or when we've gone in public. That's really weird because <laughs> uh, we, I went out to lunch or dinner or whatever with my friends and then they were there and that was kind of weird. And then like having to get my friends to like not point out the camera, I had to like train them basically. Or this one time last Christmas, we went, me and my friend Kaylee, we went to some Christmas festival thing and then they wanted to film it. And that was really weird because we got a lot of stares and someone like screamed at me. They were like, are you shooting for YouTube? And I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what exactly did you tell your friends um, in order for them not to focus on the camera and just like be present? <laughs> I don't even know. I was like, pretend the camera's not there, but then they kept bringing it up. I'm yeah. like, stop. Like, I, it's it's fine. The segment was really short anyways, and the dinner was like two hours long. They had. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Because I'm assuming that they would be like, oh, we have to edit this out. We have to edit this yeah. out. If they kept like glancing at the camera. Yeah. How were you approached about filming the documentary series? Who approached you? So... This guy named uh, Scott Bregman, he used to work for USAG and did all like their media and everything. He was the one that like would always um, do all the interviews. So like I knew him fairly well. I've known him since I was fairly young. 
Mm -hmm. um, growing up on, on the elite stage and everything. And then he started working for Olympic Channel. And I don't know if he personally came up with this idea or how it really came about, but he um, approached me because he thought I was very personable and I had a great story and everything. So that's kind of how it happened. That's awesome. Is there any specific like episode? I know that, uh, oh, by the way, All Around is uh, free and accessible on the Olympic Channel. Uh, yeah. How many episodes are there again, Morgan? Oh, I don't even know. I think there's, what is I want to say there's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Around, around, around that range. Yeah. <laughs> around eight, like but they're super short. They're only 15 minute segments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess for those who might not be familiar with all around, would you mind sort of giving, uh, an overview about what it's all about? Yes. Yeah, so all around is a docu-series and it follows, uh, me and um and then a gymnast from Russia Angelina Melnikova and a gymnast from China Chen Yu um and it just basically follows our journey leading up to the Olympics obviously they were supposed to happen this year and but all around has picked up filming again so it's going to have like season two unplanned season two uh, up until the Olympics still oh that's very cool so uh we should be on the on the lookout for a potential yeah. season two when yeah, I don't know when the next episode is dropping but I've done like little things here and there for it oh so. you have okay that's very cool something to look forward to <laughs> sure um I guess going off the all around and just being on the world stage I can't really think of anything um or there's like no other profession that represents a country like the Olympics and your um, trajectory to potentially go to the postponed Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Um, what does that feel like? I mean, it's an immense amount of pressure. I honestly feel like I put a lot more pressure on myself than others put on me just because from a very young age, even I was a very uh, people pleaser kind of person. Mm -hmm. And I, I very much still am, but I feel like that's where a lot of pressure comes from. And I also have this fear of like embarrassing myself as well. So that, but it's, it's a lot of pressure, but at the same time, I'm very grateful because I know this opportunity doesn't come for like a lot of people, but I mean, the Olympic team did get smaller, which is, absolutely terrible it's only four people on the team this year and then two individual spots so oh wow yeah but the individual spots like aren't part of the team so if you if USA gets gold when um those two people like wouldn't get the medal interesting yeah it's it's very stupid they're switching they're they already said they're switching back because the whole process even to qualify this cycle was just very confusing and no one understood it the Onga uh, Fig, which is the whole like gymnastics federation, barely understood it. <laughs> yeah, what other changes have um, has there been with you like going back to the gym and with um, the Olympics or future competitions like Worlds? Um, I mean, we don't really have a set schedule anymore. Um, a few of the U.S. girls just competed in Tokyo. Uh, Tokyo wanted to do like a kind of like a test run to see how it mm -hmm. would go post-COVID and everything. And it was very successful. There wasn't a lot of, there was only like three gymnasts from six countries, I think, for men and women. But it, apparently it was very successful and everything. But at the same time, don't really know what's going to happen next year. Some international meets are already getting canceled that were in like February or March. So. Gotcha. When was the last time you were able to com compete in a meet? Uh, I actually just competed in March. Oh, which, okay, okay. Yeah, I got very lucky because there are some, a lot, I was based, me and my friend Kayla, who I competed with, uh, were basically the only people that I got to compete this year. And mm. then I think four girls went to Canada to compete as well, but otherwise girls haven't competed since last October or even last August. Mm, gotcha, gotcha. 
I guess I'll leave with one more question before we sort of open it up to everyone, because I know everyone's eager to ask questions. And if you have any questions at this point, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, you can either DM me or you can put it in there for everyone and we can sort of read it um, so that everyone gets an opportunity to um, have their question answered, hopefully. But as a Chinese adoptee sort of straddling two different cultures and as a world-class gymnast, does this complexity of being in between two cultures, especially when you're computing um, in different countries around the world ever come up? Um, I mean, it definitely does. Just something that stems from inside of me. I feel like all adoptees uh, realize this at some point. I didn't realize it till more recently. I feel like, especially being a part of SAT and everything that I don't really know what culture I really identify with because obviously I was born in China. So, but I don't know like anything about that culture, like absolutely anything about their traditions or anything like that. I don't even speak the language I'm trying to learn, but it's not going well. It's hard. <laughs> yeah. And there's just like so much stuff. And it's hard to learn that kind of stuff when you obviously don't have anyone from there that you can like talk to because there are mm -hmm. the traditions, but then there are different traditions from like inside of that you would only know, obviously, if you like grew up there and everything. But then at the same time, it almost feels like I don't fit in here at in a in a way because I was I wasn't born here, even though I this is what I grew up with. At this, my family doesn't look like me. A lot of like other people don't look like me, and you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I guess. Have you ever been back to China? And if not, do you ever have a desire to potentially go? Um, I definitely want to go back. I was supposed to go back after I graduated high school. Mm. And, you know, gymnastics got in the way. So um, if you went back, what would your like first thing you would want to do? I know for me, I went back and um, for the very first time my junior year or my sophomore summer going into junior year in college. And I was really enticed by obviously um, learning more about where I came from and what orphanage life might have been like, but also the food. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. yeah so I guess what would you what would you want to do um, if you went back? Uh, I would definitely want to visit the orphanage. I was from and then just really try to immerse myself in the culture completely and try everything that is native to them no matter like how uh, foreign it would be to me mm -hmm. awesome well we can go ahead and open this conversation up to everyone as I know that people have questions and there's pre-submitted questions too but if anyone would like to ask a question feel free to take yourself off mute or put it in the chat box as well and there was a question um, about the recording the recording will be available to watch afterwards so if you have to leave early or if you miss any parts of it um, we'll definitely publish that to our YouTube so that you have access to it uh, there was a question that was just asked. Um, how did you deal with injuries throughout your career and the mental setback? So injuries are very difficult. They're very frustrating. And especially because um, with a sport like this, it, there's so much room for you to get re-injured. So you really have to listen to your body. And no matter how much you want to do something, just listen to it. And it might frustrate you that you can't do something but you just always have to remember the end goal uh whatever that goal may be and to just take your time and just trust that you'll get everything back gymnastics is very much of a feeling sport and if you just keep going like into the gym and every day and working out and keeping up your best shape it'll be a lot easier to get back awesome Oh, and also if people want to raise their hand, um, either like physically or with their 
um, icon, please feel free to do that. There has been a few other questions that were, I think, DM'd to me. Um, one of the questions was, how do you meet your non-gym friends since you're homeschooled and was that difficult? It definitely was. I didn't really have a lot of non-gym friends up until my best friend Kaylee went to high school. She's two years younger than me, but eventually she kind of had a group of friends and um, she became part of the band. She was, uh, she's, she still is. She's a twirler. So like her group of friends that she kind of made in the band kind of became my group of friends. Somehow I just kind of like inserted myself <laughs> a little bit. And then currently like I have some of the girls that graduated from the gym and like are in college now. Um, one of them came home over the summer and like some of her friends were visiting, came to visit her. And so I got to meet some of them and I'm actually really good friends with one of them now. Um, but other than that, I honestly don't have that many friends outside the gym <laughs> that like aren't gymnasts. <laughs> there were some questions that were submitted earlier and uh, one of them was, is there anything you've learned from gymnastics that you think adoptees would benefit from learning? I mean, gymnastics teaches you so many life lessons as it is. Um, I feel like one of them that adoptees could relate to is that you just need to find your circle, um, especially being a gymnast. The community is very accepting because the whole entire community is so diverse. Not only that, but we go to, I go to international competitions and I were competitors, but you almost could you wouldn't be able to tell kind of looks like we're all on the same team especially in between events um we're all like conversing and most of us don't even speak the same language so we're all just like making like motions at each other or like saying words until some one of us understands it so i think that's something that adoptees could very can relate to is just you need to find your circle um of the p and don't settle for anyone that's not going to accept you yeah awesome i think just like navigating life it can and it's applicable to a lot of different things, but it can be really, really hard to find your circle um, and just who, what your interests are and what your values are. And it's a constant journey as you um, transition to a different school or move to college and stuff like that. There was someone who asked, and this is more on the cultural side, do you recommend or encourage younger kids to visit their provinces or et cetera when they get older? I mean, it's hard to speak just because I haven't done it myself, mm -hmm. but I, I would recommend it. I feel like it could be so cool to be able to see exactly where you're from. I feel like it might open a lot of doors, answer some questions that you might have. Yeah, definitely. I know that like when I visited I've never visited my my province, but when I went to China, I was like searching for uh, answers that I didn't really know I had. And then every time I visit and leave, I always sort of end up with more questions than answers. <laughs> but that just sort of seems similar for um, a lot of people when they're visiting their roots, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh hope asked when you get overwhelmed what do you do um I like to try to ground myself I take very deep breaths and I remind myself I actually keep telling myself I say like one skill one motion time and I that can be applied to anything in life just to take one thing at a time so like literally just like break it down um when I do a routine I literally break it down to like my arm moving and that's just one thing and so you just have to like keep moving on and just to really ground yourself there's um a trick too that you use that where you like for anxiety you uh find five things that you can see like three things you can smell like uh four things you can touch and stuff like that when did you sort of learn these techniques that helped you ground yourself Honestly, it just came with experience and kind of trial and error, I guess, and people telling me like, oh, you just need to like calm down and like take deep, like when someone's trying to calm me down, they'll be like, take deep breaths. And I remember that I'm like, oh, that worked. I'll use that next time. But it really just came with experience. Mm, yeah. 
One second. The chat is blowing up for me in direct messages. So let me scroll through them. Um, oh, do you have any siblings and are they adopted or biological? Um, no, I'm actually an only child, unfortunately. <laughs> What was it like growing up as an only child and as an adoptee in Delaware? Um, not gonna lie, it was kind of lonely on the on the only child aspect of it because uh, I didn't always like have someone to play with or interact with. I had to find friends and everything like that. Growing up as an adoptee, I almost didn't notice it. Only sometimes, and I guess. When I was younger, I really just didn't, it did not cross my mind that I did not look like everyone else. I knew I was from somewhere different. I knew from a very young age, my mom told me that I was adopted from Venice. So uh, mentally I knew, but I went to um, a Christian school, a private Christian school where mm -hmm. I was one of like the two people out of a 30 person class, two people of color in my entire class. And they would make fun of me for being, nice, but for some reason it never really crossed my mind. It's because of the way I looked. Just like it was more like, oh, she's Chinese because she was born in China. <laughs> oh, I think Lily raised her hand. Lily, did you want to ask a or Lisa? Sorry, Lisa raised her hand. Lisa, would you like to ask a question? That's okay. Hi. Um, thanks for letting adoptive mom join in. We feel I just feel lucky that I get to listen in when you guys all talk. Um, all of you adoptees. It's, it's a privilege and a gift for me to listen to your experiences. Um, Maureen, this is my daughter Viv. She's my youngest. I also have, I have two daughters from China. Uh, one of them is Eloise and she's tuned in but doesn't have a video on I don't think. Um, but Vivi is nine and do you want to tell her a little bit about yourself? Um, I'm a level four gymnast and I was wondering if you had any advice for me. Oh, yeah, of course. I think that's awesome that you're a gymnast. Um, some advice I could give you is just to really, I know it's a very hard sport and can be very frustrating and very difficult at times, but to try to just always remember that to have fun. And if you can make very short term goals for yourself, um, whether that's getting a skill or making three in a row of a skill the next day, but it could really um, help you keep your drive. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I guess going back to the school and experiencing a little bit of bullying for what you look like since you were one of the only people of color in your school, uh, someone asked a question that was submitted earlier um, about sort of race and racism and if it affected any aspect of your gymnastics career or I guess even navigating school when you were younger? Um, regarding my gymnastics career, it never really affected me because I come from a very diverse gym. Um, just, I mean, it's just very diverse school aspect wise. I get, like I said before, I never really like, for some reason I never really thought about that. I, it's because I looked different. Um, Obviously, I guess subconsciously I did because I did ask for one of those American Girl dolls that uh, you can customize. And I asked for her with blue eyes and blonde curly hair because that's what mm -hmm. I want it to look like. <laughs> yeah, I feel like even for me um, throughout my life, I found myself like internalizing these things that I really didn't know whether that was wanting the blue eyed um, blonde hair Barbie doll and mm -hmm. stuff like that and it's not until later I recognized oh that was a lot of just what was yeah. surrounding me um, yeah. and there's even moments and I don't know maybe you can speak to some of yours um, that I'm still processing I'm like oh that was definitely due to um, my environment um, I mean I probably definitely have moments like that I feel like they like you said they're not they don't process until you really look back on them but I feel like as I've gotten older I've become a lot more comfortable in my skin and I think I I love the way I look I love that um and you know everyone now is like add a little flavor <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> uh let's see 
does anyone have oh there was a question asked in the chat um and i think it was to everyone if morgan you wanted to answer this question oh and real fast the question was i'm curious about what it's like competing with your glasses on uh, I'm a runner and I always ran with glasses and I'm wondering how your glasses stay on while you're flipping. <laughs> yeah, so I, I've worn glasses since I was nine in gymnastics. I've worn glasses since I was about six years old, but I tried contacts and everything, but I did not like the way that my eyes felt. They would just get dried out very quickly. And it was really annoying when like chalk or a piece of pit would get in my eye and I would have to waste practice time, you know, going to take it out and reapplying contact and like what if I lost my contact and stuff like that. But I actually I have a strap so it attaches to the um the arms of my glasses like around my head. It's like an elastic mm. strap, like you can adjust it and everything. But before that, I actually tied pre-wrap around it instead. <laughs> Cool. Thanks. I was just so curious when I would see you with it because I know like running even sometimes they would like fall, like start yeah. something and I was curious. Even now they like sometimes they like bounce up and down and if I get really hot, obviously like they like um fog up and everything, but it's just something that I'm used to now. Okay. There was another question that was asked. Um, how has your life changed <laughs> since you had a uh, hundred thousand Instagram followers. Do you get recognized on the street? Are there a lot of upsides? Are there some downsides? Um, I mean, I guess it hasn't changed. I mean, that much uh, in real life, anyways. Obviously, on my phone, I turned off my notifications for Instagram and Twitter and stuff because my phone would die really quickly, especially after I posted something. Mm. Um, I uh, I get. So I get some weird DMs sometimes. Uh, I don't really necessarily get recognized a lot. Uh, and when I do, it's very sporadic. And of course, it's always at the worst times. Mm. Uh, there's like a Walgreens by my house that I go to because it's so close. And like just this one time I like went, I think I probably was about to go to bed, but I needed something. And I had like sweatpants and a hoodie on. I probably just showered and I looked like a rat. And this guy recognized me and it was just like absolutely terrible. <laughs> Did he want to take a photo with you? No, thank God, because he was working. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay boy, yeah, I don't go to that Walgreens anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, a question, what do you think is your next step or in your adoption journey? And do you want to search for your biological family? Um, so my next step, I think I'm for Christmas, I'm actually going to ask for a 23andMe. Uh, I've done Ancestry, but I've heard 23andMe actually goes like more like in depth and like in terms like medical and everything. And if I feel like if I'm in another system, then there's more of a chance of me possibly finding some type of family. Um, mm -hmm. I would love to search for my biological parents. I don't know how likely that will because I found um, the paperwork says that like uh, a search was conducted and nothing was found, but that's you know we get there when we get there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and for everyone, twenty uh, three and Me and Ancestry .com, there are different DNA tests that uh, people in the adoption community often take to try to trace their roots. Uh, uh, our organization also launched My Taproot in 2017, I believe, and that is the first large scale internationally coordinated effort between the US and China, but that's strictly for searching for birth parents in China, not your entire family. Uh, there is one person that asked, do you know anyone from your biological family? Um, and I they don't. found their second cousin through a 23andMe. <laughs> Does anyone else have any other questions? I know there was one more in the chat, but I do want to give people an opportunity if they want to ask Morgan themselves too. You can take your um, microphone off mute. Someone asked, is your hyperextension a cause of some elbow issues? They did gymnastics for around five years and have hyperextended elbows as well. 
and it caused a lot of issues and how do you learn not to overextend them? I actually don't have hyperextended elbows. What happened was I, when I was about 11, my elbow like popped or something and I went to the doctor and I actually, I have extra cartilage. Um, At first they put me in a cast to see if it would pop back into place, which was completely stupid. I went and got a second opinion months later and I actually had to get it surgically removed. And then in 2017, since like, I was 11 when that initially happened. Uh, it, my body grew, it grew back, it chipped <laughs> off, whatever happened. I don't even know. Uh, so I had to get it removed again. Cause it would, it, um, it would cause like locking in my elbow. So I wouldn't be able to like move my arm past like certain degrees and things. And obviously that's a problem. And then I had another one in 2018 because there was still like another little piece that was causing me problems, mm. but no, my elbow's very straightened now. From your very first injury or your, what was your experience like and how did you like mentally cope with sort of coming back? I remember when I did gymnastics and I am a very poor example, um, but I, I broke my wrist and it basically, um, I didn't really go back to the sport. (laughs) So yeah, I guess, how did you sort of overcome those mental challenges? Oh. I was pretty young when it initially happened. So Mm. I was like, ah, it's fine. Like, obviously it was kind of boring because I couldn't do everything that I wanted to, but I would just find whatever that I could do. I remember the first day I had my cast on, I was like, can I go do front bulls on trampoline? And my coach was like, no, not at all. Uh, And then I would do like one arm handstands. I would hang from the bar at an incline and do leg lifts that way. Um, I, that's, I would work on my leaps. I would just find anything that I was capable of doing. Mm. Okay. I think we have time for maybe three more questions. There were two in the chat. Um, one person asked, there are other adoptees on the national team. Have you felt more connected to them with having the shared experience of adoption? Um, did you find Did you ever find yourself gravitating more towards other gymnasts or friends who are of your same race or ethnicity? Um, not really. I feel like it's just because a lot the gymnasts that are adopted on national team didn't really come to the elite scene until a lot later. And, uh, I was kind of, I kind of grew up on it. I did these things called developmental camp, which is what comes before national team camp. So those girls I grew up with. And then when we, went to national team camp together we just kind of like stayed a group while as like these other girls kind of came a a little bit later but it's kind of funny there's this one girl she's not on national team anymore um she was in 2017 i believe yeah uh her name is adeline kenlin and we actually come from the same exact orphanage but just a year apart so i'm a year older oh wow that's amazing yeah (laughs) How did you uh, sort of stumble across that information? I don't even know. I think our moms were talking. Well, okay. I didn't even know she was adopted. I don't think she knew I was adopted. I, that's not something like, you know, like 10-year-olds talk about or anything. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And then we found out and I, I just thought that was funny. And then it was like mentioned in like a few podcasts, like gymnastics podcasts or whatever. And I, I remember our, um, our coach is telling one of the staff at national team and he was like what oh my god that's so crazy and he was like freaking out about it and me and her just like (laughs) okay (laughs) that's awesome lisa asked any advice for a gymnast mama um i would say i mean everyone's different i was always kind of the kid that didn't really even want to talk about practice my mom would be like how was practice i'd be like good that, and that was excited. If I wanted to tell her something, then I would. But I would say if your gymnast is like that, then I like don't push, don't be, don't, don't be that mom that goes and researches all the skills and knows all the terminology and everything like that. And is almost judging your kids' videos alongside with your coach. Just kind of be there for them and be like, oh, that was good. And that's really all they need because they already have their coach judging them. They already have judges judging them. They're judging themselves very hard. So you just need to be the supporter. And honestly, the less you know about gymnastics, the better. (laughs) 
Awesome. Thanks, Morgan. When is the next camp for you guys if it doesn't get canceled? Uh, I have no idea just yet. <laughs> Very fair. And Hope asked, did you always know you were adopted or, uh, yeah, or did you find out later on? Um, I always knew. I don't remember exactly when my mom told me that I was adopted, but I just always knew even from like a very young age like when I don't know I think my mom told me when I was like three or four but I honestly I obviously don't remember the conversation but I just always remember being oh I'm adopted mm -hmm. yeah, that. <laughs> well I know our time um it's almost four o'clock here so we're hitting our hour mark do you have any advice for uh, a young young aspiring uh, adoptees who want to become gymnasts? Um, I mean, honestly, just go for it. Go to a class, see how it works out. It's going to be extremely difficult, but that's just the sport. And the more you can build up your physical strength, the easier it will be. And you just have to stay so mentally tough because it's such a incredibly difficult sport. But ultimately it pays off because it teaches you so many life lessons. I see. Uh, we can do a quick speed round because there's a few questions that have come through. Uh, Morgan, what type of gymnastics do you do? I do artistic gymnastics. And if you want children, would you also want to adopt? Um, I'm kind of on the edge about that. I don't really know if I want kids. <laughs> I'm not even gonna lie. <laughs> That's fair. Uh, do you have any advice for younger adoptees and how to deal with sad moments about adoption? Um, it's really hard for me to give advice because I'm still trying to learn that myself. Like I said before, I never really processed the whole adoption thing. I obviously I knew, but it never really like occurred to me that that could be like a part of how I am, like why I am like I am and everything like that. But I guess some of the advice I could give is just to find someone very trusted and to talk it out with them. They may not be able to offer the best advice or give you answers, but just like getting it out there and talking it out can help. Awesome. Well, I think that is a perfect way to end this conversation. I know that uh, there's some people who said pictures and since we can't take a pictures individually with you because we're not in person um if people want to take a photo with morgan we can go ahead and do a huge group screenshot uh if people want to turn on their cameras and join me in the screenshot with morgan heard Cool. We will wait and see if anyone else wants to join. Okay, we will go ahead and take a photo. Uh, so <laughs> three, two, one, cheese. Awesome. And then let's go ahead and we always love to do funny uh, screenshots also at the park. So if everyone wants to sort of find Morgan on your screen and you can point to her <laughs> and Morgan, if you want to make a yeah, funny face or something, uh, find her on your screen. Did we find her? Awesome. Okay. One, two, three, cheese. Yay. That was great. Well, thank you so much again for joining us um, in honor of National Adoption Awareness Month. We Thank really, you. really, of course, uh, we really, really uh, appreciated the time you took to speak with us um, in all in your perspective as a professional athlete and just also as an adoptee navigating the complexities of um, everything that comes along with adoption. Uh, we do have more events coming up like this throughout November and also uh, year round. We have a self-defense workshop with Kira Omens, who is a Chinese adoptee living in LA. She's an actress and a model and a martial artist. And she'll be leading a self-defense workshop this Saturday at 10.30 a.m. Mountain Time. And then we have 
a fun holiday charcuterie board led by one of our virtual coordinators also in um, LA who's been involved with the organization since she was um, a teenager. So that will be fun. And that is on November 30th at 4 p.m. And we also have live streams going on um, next week with adoptive parents and ad adult adoptees, along with another live stream on November 30th. But thank you all so much for joining us. And can we yeah. give another round of applause to Morgan for her time? Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. It was so fun to hear from you. Thank yeah, you thank so you much. for having me. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening, your holiday season. Well, you as well. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. All.